the uh, civil rights movement, there's never been a, a struggle that has been successful without our young people being involved. When Dr. Martin Luther King decided that he was going to invite young people, high school students and college students, to serve on the front line in Birmingham and Montgomery and Selma, a lot of people questioned why. But Dr. King understood that if they didn't get involved, their parents wouldn't get involved. If their parents didn't get involved, their grandparents wouldn't get involved. When we see our young people on the street, when we see them in harm's way, we have a tendency to get up and move. Today, people are getting up and they're moving because young people are moving us. They're saying enough is enough. It is unfortunate that we have to be led by our children, but I don't know about you, I'm glad they're out here, and I'm glad they're leading us. Welcome to another exciting episode of Paul Brown Show. This evening, I have a special guest. He's Mr. Daryl G. Gray, and he's run for Missouri House of Representatives to, for District 77. How you doing there, Mr. Gray? I'm doing fine, uh, Mr. Brown, and thank you very much for an opportunity to be on your show. I, I watch it uh, consistently, and it's, it's, it's really a pleasure and an honor. Great, great, uh, and I'm glad to have you on the show. And um, tell a little bit, audience, oh, a little bit about yourself. Well, um, I've got about 40 years' experience in civil rights. Uh, Reverend Dr. Ralph David Abernathy recruited me out of college at Benedict to work with the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Uh, I've worked as executive secretary for the NAACP out of Atlanta, uh, served in the Kansas State Senate. Uh, for a little while, and uh, most of my work has been done through the Progressive National Baptist Convention, which is the denominational home of the late Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. I currently serve as Secretary of the Missouri Democratic Party, and I chair our Progressive Caucus uh, for the party as well. I think you know I'm a former U.S. Army veteran, and uh, just been committed to uh, civil rights advocacy and human rights advocacy, really, Paul, for most of my life, beginning in Spartanburg, South Carolina. Great, great. You're a member of Mega Psi Pi Fraternity Incorporated? Yes. Well, there is no, well, listen, if you talk about fraternities, there is none other than the Purple and Go. Purple and Go. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. Going back into. What made you decide to want to run for office? Well, you know, as I said, I've, I've been involved politically, Paul, all of my life, uh, probably starting back at Dorman High School in Spartanburg, South Carolina. Uh, I worked uh, for a little while with Dick Riley, a former governor of South Carolina, uh, helping to uh, register uh, and recruit uh, college students around the state of South Carolina. Um, working with Reverend Jackson, uh, also a fraternity brother, when he ran for president the first time. So politics has, has really been in my blood uh, because I think that we've got to go from protest to politics to policy if really we're going to affect any change in our society, be it on the local level, the state level, or on the national level. And so um, I'm thankful that I've had a propensity uh, not simply for politics, but for public service, and uh, bitten by the bug a long time ago and not able to shake it. Okay, what are three key messages that you want to have on your campaign that you're talking about on your campaign? Well, particularly in Missouri, you've got to look at Missouri as being the, the center of America. Uh, where the Midwest goes, oftentimes goes the rest of the country. And so as a, uh, a civil rights veteran, I, I hope to, to bring some human rights advocacy uh, to a Republican-led legislature here in Missouri. And I think that is important when we talk about uh, issues of, of uh, police violence, 
when we talk about reforming the criminal justice system, uh, promoting common sense gun laws. Uh, Missouri has three cities in the top 15 of gun violence among African American men. Uh, There's St. Louis, number one, Kansas City, number four, and Springfield, Missouri, number 12 out of 15. And so we've got to work to uh, advocate for common sense gun laws. We have the most lax gun legislation of any state uh, in America. And just here in St. Louis last year, we had about 194 uh, gun violent deaths. We normally average between 190 and 200, and we've done that over the last 10 years. And then we talk about climate change and particularly environmental racism, lead poisoning, um, the, the reality of uh, black communities that continue to suffer uh, from landfills adjacent to our communities and, and dumps. Uh, and so we've got to begin uh, uh, water, uh, the type of water that we're drinking, uh, not you know as bad as Flint, Michigan, uh, but the toxicity of our water. And so those are three things that I try to highlight. But unfortunately, Paul, there are really many, many more uh, that affect particularly marginalized communities and African-American, uh, African-American communities uh, in this state. Uh, and those are some of the things that, that I want to go to Jefferson City and our legislature and really fight for. We've, we've criminalized uh, abortion. Uh, in the state of Missouri. I make people very clear. I am uh, very pro-choice. I'm, I may be anti-abortion in my, you know, in my understanding, but I'm very pro-choice in my position. Uh, and so we've got to begin to look at those things and look at it from the standpoint uh, of advocacy uh, in Jefferson City. Mm. Okay, Mr. Gray. For the audience in Missouri who may not be familiar, you said District 77. What does that consist of? District 77 is uh, the center core of St. Louis. Uh, St. Louis obviously is the uh, highest populated uh, urban area in the state. Uh, You're looking at a district that is, I would say, uh, 70 percent plus african-american uh it probably is the district with the highest amount of poverty uh infant mortality rate is higher uh the unemployment rate is higher uh the crime rate is higher so i generally have the urban core of st louis okay and that's i guess that's important because a lot of people that they, they need to know exactly are you going to be the one to represent them? And I think that's a very important question. I mean, Paul, my my history, I think, speaks to that question. Uh, I've been a public servant all of my life. Uh, I could have uh, I could have worked in corporate America. I could have gone to law school. I was actually accepted to the University of South Carolina Law School and Dalhousie Law School, and chose to work with Reverend Jackson in civil rights. Uh, I've, I've been on the front line. I came to St. Louis uh, during the Ferguson uprising after the murder of Mike Brown. Uh, I've been consistent, uh, and people know that. But in addition to you know my, my advocacy uh, verbally, people have seen that uh, I've been involved in public hearings as it relates to crafting public policy. Remember, as I said in the beginning of your program, uh, it's important that we move, as Dr. King would uh, uh, would have us, from protest to politics to policy. It's not enough just to shake the political tree. Uh, there are things that fall off of those trees. And Paul, if we're not in a position uh, to turn that into substantive policy that really affects the daily lives of people, uh, then what we're doing is in vain. And so I, I think that I believe that people have seen not only my activism, uh, but they've also seen my commitment as well. Great. What would you say are the characteristic or principle 
that's most important for an elected official? Well, I know that the, the good thing about your show is that you, you're very balanced in your, in your politics. I tell people, don't be like Donald Trump. I mean, you, you've got to be committed and compassionate uh, to the needs of your constituents. The office has got to serve the constituents. The constituents are not there to serve the office. And the office is not there to serve the office holder. Uh, I believe that, uh, you know, I, I'm also uh, a Baptist preacher of 37 years. Uh, I believe that the old song says, uh, let my living not be in vain. Uh, I think that people need to know, uh, as an elected official, that everything that you do uh, as you hold that office is to make their lives better, to improve the condition or state that they're living in. And when you have a community that has that is chronically and historically had double figure unemployment, when you've got a community that uh, seemingly lives in a war zone where uh, there's a shooting uh, going on uh, every day, it may not be a murder every day, but there's a shooting every day. Uh, when you have people who are crying out for government government officials. To start really dealing with the issues of a marginalized community and not continue to take advantage of that community, I think that complete commitment and compassion uh, for your constituents has to be one of the number one attributes of any public servant. Voting rights, civil rights, human rights, reproductive rights, all of these issues are not just on the ballot, but they're in our vote. And so we have to go out. We have to take someone out. We should run to the polls. This passion and this thing that you have is really important. And you know, it's like the qualities. What does you think is necessary to be successful as an office holder? I think hard work and dedication. I think that this is something that you have to live, Paul. Uh -huh. uh, when you're holding public office, yeah, it can't be a nine to five. Uh, and particularly uh, in an area like the 77th district, people need to know that they can, that they have accessibility to you. Reverend Jackson taught me something a long time ago when I asked him the same question uh, about qualities of leadership. And he said that when you are standing in front of your constituency, and they can reach out to you and you reach back to them. If you're able to touch each other, then you're being effective. You stop being effective when they're reaching out to you, you're reaching back to them and there's a gap. Uh, you've got to show up at the community meetings. Uh, you've got to show up at the ward meetings. Uh, you've got to show up at the town halls. You've got to show up at the barbershop and the beauty shop. Uh, you've got to make yourself available to to students at their high schools. And so uh, it cannot be a nine to five. You've got to live this. And people need to see that you're dedicated to their concerns. Um, the, the, the single mom who has two, three children trying to make ends meet, the, the families uh, where mom and pop are both working, but they're not making a livable wage. Uh, You've got to make sure that you speak to that, that you speak to the $15 an hour that is necessary, to, to, that you speak to the adequate uh, after-school programs and, and health care that's essential. You've got to speak to, to what I call you know, common issues, everyday issues, issues that we, we call that would keep us up at 1 o'clock in the morning, 2 o'clock in the morning, trying to figure out how am I going to take care of my family. How am I going to pay my bills? How am I going to keep my child uh, in school? Or where is my child at? Uh, is, is, is he or she going to come home uh, tonight? Uh, or, or do I have to worry about over-policing uh, in my community? And so I think that those things are, are essential. Yes, they are, sir. Okay, how would you consider, what would be the difference between what you provide for this district and the person that is currently 
holding that position? That is an excellent question. Uh, the, current, the person who's currently holding the position is a good friend of mine. His name is uh, Steve Roberts, Jr., uh, and he's a lawyer. Exceptional young man. Uh, I think that what I do is, it's, it's like a handoff uh, um, in, a, uh, in a relay. Steve is going to run for the state senate. Uh, it's a vacant seat. And so the good news is I'm not running against him. Uh, I'm running really to, to compliment uh, what Steve has done in this district. He has worked hard, and he's kind of handing that ball off to me, and we're running that relay. What, what I bring that Steve uh, did not have, uh, Steve was more analytical. Steve was, uh, you know, from being a lawyer, I think I bring more of a grassroots flavor uh, to this particular position. Uh, my work with the uh, Southern Christian Leadership Conference, my work with the Progressive National Baptist Convention, my work with the uh, NAACP, my work with Ferguson Frontline Protesters, I think that brings a different dynamic and dimension. And uh, my work in, in building coalitions and, and building alliances, I think will, will definitely expand on what Representative Roberts has been able to do in the district. Okay, I know one of the key things that we probably need to talk to our community is families. How important is family in your life and how does that mix into you thinking about other families in the district? Well, you know, I, I was, I was uh, very, uh, I guess, and I'm trying to think of the right word here, Paul. My, my mother and father were both together. My father, 25-year Navy veteran. Uh, my mother taught elementary school. So I, I lived in a household where I had both my mother and my father. Uh, my mother and father taught us um, uh, the value of family. Uh, that was important for us to look out for each other. Uh, and and we, we were strengthened by each other. Uh, I think the dynamics of family uh, from when I was growing up has changed considerably. Uh, I think that there seems to be, Paul, uh, this influence upon the family today that doesn't speak to strong families. It doesn't speak to strengthening families. We, we've got a lot of single families out there, many of them doing exceptionally well. Uh, single parent households, be it mother or father. And I always tell people, I'd like to be very clear, uh, having a single family alone doesn't necessarily mean gloom and doom. Uh, but, you know, when you've got a single parent trying to raise children, uh, it is very difficult. The concept of family, it's not like it, it, it used to be. You've got uh, younger parents, uh, you know, these days, grandmother's 36 years old, uh, whereas back in my day, you know, grandmother was 60-some years old. Uh, and so there is a difference. Well, we had grandmother and grandfather in our lives, guiding mother, guiding father, being there as a supplement parent. Uh, but, but that's not the same now. And so I do think, Paul, that it is important that we do whatever we can to help to strengthen particularly black families, uh, and to be able to support black families uh, wherever we can. I think the church has got to play a bigger role uh, in doing that. I don't think it's the role of the elected official to do that, but I do think it's the role of the church uh, to go back into the lives of the family, uh, to talk about values, to talk about standards, uh, to talk about responsibility that families have to community, and responsibilities that community has to family. Hmm. Mr. Gray, what legacy would you like to leave not only to your family, but to your community? Well, I always believe that we should live for the sake of others. I think that's important. I've always uh, believed, as Dr. King, uh, that we are our brothers and our sisters' keepers. Uh, and that there is intersectionality, or at least should be, uh, between black and white. 
between the educated and the uneducated, between rich and old, uh, between, excuse me, rich and, and poor, between young and old. Uh, and I believe uh, Dr. King said something that I try to live by, that we need to build alliances based upon necessity and not necessarily desirability. We really are a beloved community, or at least if we're not, Paul, we need to strive to be a beloved community. And then in this month when we honor Dr. King, I try to live my life through the experience of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, but also examples like Dr. King. And so uh, when people look at my life, I would hope that they would see those two uh, uh, human beings emulating from my life. Mm. Pastor, Brother Gray, now I know you've been a lot with uh, not only like Martin Luther King and a lot of the other people that go out there and fight for the people in that community. How does it feel to know that you have learned from some great leaders? Well, I tell you, Paul, um, being in the presence of people uh, like the King family, uh, the late uh, Mrs. Coretta Scott King, and um, you know uh, Andy, uh, you know people like Andy Young and Jesse Jackson and Joe Lowry, Ben Hooks, uh, John Lewis. Uh, you know, just being in the presence of, of, of greatness, uh, Rosa Parks. You know, being in the same room with Rosa Parks and, and Nelson Mandela. Uh, in your life um, my life has been amazing um, and the, the guidance and the wisdom uh, that has come from from those kind of people uh, Jim Clyburn our own congressman in, in South Carolina uh, I've lived a very blessed and gifted life uh, and a lot of times Paul just being in their presence I've lived a mountaintop experience. Uh, but what they've told me and what I've learned from them is that you can't stay on the mountaintop, uh, that you've got to go back into the valley and you've got to be in the valley to help to, to pull someone or push someone, uh, support someone who is in the valley trying to reach the mountaintop themselves. And... Um, I believe that to whom much is given, much is required. And I have been blessed uh, through my life uh, to sit at the feet, as you said, of some civil rights and human rights giants. But by doing so, I have an obligation to share that experience and to share that wisdom and to share their thoughts with others as well. Mm. Now, um have you ever looked in the mirror and after all those great leaders that you just named, that you've had the presence to be around and say, God, just thank you or why me? <laughs> and you know, I mean, cause yeah. you, you some awesome really, names. Well, that is, that is an excellent question. And, and I do, uh, I do oftentimes ask, you know, my, I ask God, I said, why me? You know, when you're standing on the front line, be it Ferguson or, or St. Louis, or, you know, when you think about, uh, you know, what has transpired in our country over the years, uh, the, uh, the election of the first black president, President Barack Obama, and, uh, you know, being in the room with him, uh, being able to visit the White House in my lifetime a couple of years. Like, you know, a little boy growing up in, in Spartanburg, South Carolina, uh, attending Lincoln Elementary and Lincoln High School, graduating from Benedict College, you know, walking the dirt roads of Spartanburg, and now, you know, you've you know, I've been all over the world. I've met some some giants, uh, and I do, I you know, I find myself saying, Lord, you know, why me? And then, you know, God speaks to us and says, Why not you? You know, we have to believe, Paul, that God can use anyone. No matter what, and, and I, I'll tell anybody when I'm speaking, I'm not perfect. 
you know, I've, I've, I've made my mistakes. I've, I've failed in probably more things that I've succeeded in. But I think that that's the example. I think that when people look at my life, Paul, and what I've been through in my life, the good, the bad, and the ugly, but to also see what I've accomplished, that young people, be they black or white or brown or red or yellow, wherever they come from, can say, if I can see it, I can be it. And so I, I like to believe that when I tell my story, that there are those who say, I can do it too. I can be it too. No matter where I come from, no matter my failures, I can do something that is going to benefit the lives of others also. I can be a better person. And I, I, I pray, uh, Paul, that that would be my legacy, that because God chose to use me uh, in public service, that I can be the best that I can be in this capacity. Mm. Mr. Gray, we're kind of running short on time. Um, what is something that you would like to say to not your supporters, but your non-supporter when running for this office? Oh, that's, that, that's a great question. I don't think anybody's ever asked me that. I mean, I just say to folk, uh, look at my history. Look at, look at the work that I've done. Uh, don't look at, uh, don't look at me from, from the eyes of a, per, a personality lens, but ask yourself the question, am I qualified to do the job? Does my background and my experience speak to what you need your state representative to be? And I think if people are honest and asking themselves that question, Paul, I think that I would be successful in the August primary. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Dow Gray, he's running for representative of Missouri, the 77th district. Mr. Gray, thank you for contact us coming on the show and we look forward to having more conversation with you throughout this campaign and paul i want to thank you for the work that you're doing on your show you you not only do you educate and inform but you inspire people uh and i wish you all the best in your endeavors as well thank you mr great for everyone thank you for watching the show and you be encouraged moving through city hall Move it through Jefferson City. Move it through Washington, D.C. And let the elected officials know that we will continue to show up being led and guided by our children. And let them know that we will not go away.